Recording and live stream day. I see the people coming in at the bottom. That's good to see. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. All right. Well, welcome to Preservation North Carolina Shelter Series. I'm Julianne Patterson, and I'm Preservation North Carolina's Outreach Manager. We started this series about places that matter last year, and we learned that these virtual events created access to connect with more of you across the state. Our annual statewide preservation conference is also virtual this year and taking place later this month, October 21st and 22nd. Details, registration information, and recordings of past programs are all available on our website, preservationnc.org. We love that we can present the shelter series to you free of charge. If you're enjoying this series, please consider becoming a member, making a gift, or sponsoring a future program to help us keep it going. This afternoon, we're excited to present Queen Anne's Revenge and Wilmington's Other Battleship. I have Gareth Evans from the Bellamy Mansion Museum in Wilmington joining me, who will introduce our speaker. But first, I want to go over a few housekeeping items for those of you who might be new to the shelter series. Um, so first of all, because it's a webinar, we can't see you or hear you, um, but you can see us. So we know you're there. Thank you for coming. Um, I'll moderate questions at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to ask them anytime using the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you're having any sort of technical issues, let me know by typing it into the chat and I'll do my best to help. A brief survey will pop up when you exit the webinar. And if you have a moment to give us feedback, it helps us improve and learn what works. Um, thank you again for joining us. And now I'll turn it over to Garrett. All right, thanks, Julianne. Um... Yep, my name is Gareth Evans. I'm the director at the Bellamy Mansion Museum, and I'm here because I work for Preservation North Carolina in that capacity. And uh, Mark was good enough to give this speech right before COVID, about a year and a half ago, uh, and it was fascinating. It's just a wonderful talk. Um, I'm going to give you his bio briefly. I'm going to try very hard not to lapse into a pirate accent while I do so. Um, so, Dr. Mark Wild Ramsing, in the 1970s, part of a program uh, that found the Nuestra Señora de la Regla in the Cape Fear River right here in Wilmington, where he lives. Um, and in 1996, he was director of the Queen Anne's Revenge Project when it was found, uh, the wreck near Beaufort, North Carolina, both of which are our stories today, of course. Uh, his job title, which sounds super cool, um, was Underwater Archaeologist uh, for the North Carolina Division of An um, Archives and History. Uh, he was there from 1978 to 2012 when he retired. He's the co-author of Blackbeard's Sunken Prize, which uh, I highly recommend as a great read with some wonderful illustrations of all the artifacts that were found on the wreck. Um, but beyond those two finds uh, we're gonna talk about today, uh, there's a mass of topics, educational programming, sunken history, I guess he's been involved in, um, and also educational programming over the years with eight graders, eighth graders in Pender County, Cape Fear Museum down here in Wilmington, dive programs up and down our coast. So, all of that, and as part of that, he won the Order of the Longleaf Pine from Governor Bev Perdue on his retirement. So with that, I'll get off and let you hear this great story of two uh, wonderful underwater historical finds. Thank you, Gareth, very much. And thank you, Julianne, for inviting me today. And I look forward to filling you in fairly quickly on what uh, my career and all the the uh, great aspects to it. And I'm gonna see if I can get, find my slideshow. Let's see. Looks like we may have lost Mark. Uh, let's see if we can jump back on real quick. Just bear
Mark, let me know if you need any help. Let me know if you need any help, Mark. Okay, we're um, now I'm trying to find my files. And I have it on my computer too, if you want me to pull it up. If you pull it up, that'd be great. Okay. And you just tell me when to go. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for again for having me and sorry I disappeared under the breakers there to look around. Uh, I began my career um, in, in the beginnings of underwater archaeology and, and sort of grew up with it. Okay, I'll give you a, Julianne. Trying to get this. And the underwater archaeology began, really began in, yeah, the slides are cut off. There we go. Can you see everything now? It looks better. Yep. Looks good. So I'll just, so um, next, boy, it's coming in slow. Are you seeing Eagles Island? Yes. Yeah, so the underwater archaeology is a uh, state program, one of the best in the country, and it sort of oversees all of the shipwrecks, anything that's lost 10 years in a day in state waters, which goes out three miles and uh, in about anywhere you can paddle a canoe, is state property. If you haven't, if the owner hasn't uh, continually tried to claim it and, and find it. So that's a lot of, uh, lot of, lot of wrecks through the uh, 500 years that North Carolina has been around, but, or the, the uh, European uh, explorations, and actually we found Native American canoes and things too. One of the neatest areas though is right across from Wilmington, downtown Wilmington, in an area called Eagles Island. Next. Are you able to advance it? There we go. Are you seeing North Carolina's booming port? Yes. Okay. And this area was sort of it's a it's a wet swamp swampy area, but as Wilmington grew and uh, sort of grew at the habitable areas on the Wilmington side, it expanded over to this Eagles Island, and and uh, there was just a, a ton of activity. It was the main port during the Civil War uh, for the Confederacy. At the end, it was a lot of shipbuilding, World War One. There was uh, uh, this tar and turpentine, you see. So uh, it was a booming place, and, and lots of archaeological evidence uh, eventually was left there. Okay, next. Well, after World War II, the state port uh, moved down to uh, below Wilmington, down below the bridge, and that the whole area there pretty much went, uh, it was abandoned, and there were, uh, there were buildings and uh, boats, tugboats, the iconic es Esco was over there that was photographed and painted for years and years uh, before it, it eventually dilapidated. 
But one of the most intriguing was this hull you see here, the shape of a vessel. It's about 140 feet long, uh, the ribs of it. You can see as you cross over the Wilmington Memorial Bridge heading toward heading west, if you look down, be careful not to drive off the bridge, but you'll, you, you'll see it at low tide. Okay, next. And this is where I got my start in underwater archeology. span There was a, the state program was just started and it linked up with UNCW and there was a, held a field school, which I had just graduated from my, uh, from Wake Forest in, in archaeology and uh, was looking for something to do. And so that's, that's how we could learn because here you have a what's under uh, underwater wreck that's actually you can walk around and, and take measurements and learn how to do archaeology. Okay, next. So in the mid 80s, we got a lot of experts down to in, in to in uh, catalog all these different wrecks. There's over 40 vessels, abandoned vessels, from row boats up to this large steamer, the, the relics of it, between the two bridges, from uh, up to the battleship and a little bit past down to the Memorial Bridge. And so we cataloged all those and brought in experts from the Smithsonian, the uh, Mariner's Museum, Mystic Seaport, and uh, to, but to, to help us with these. And they've all been included on the, the Wilmington National Register Historic District. Uh, but the one wreck that continued to sort of buffalo us, baffle us was, the, uh, was this Eagles Island steamer. Next. And uh, there was one reference to this beautiful Sylvan Grove New York steamer that was, uh, operated, came down, operated between Wilmington and Southport and Carolina Beach through the 80s and 90s. And then it uh, was reportedly burned right across the river, pretty close to where we were. But the problem was the, it was a little bit longer and the machinery didn't quite match up. Next. So I was, I uh, gotten up with a fellow named Charlie Baker who was running sort of an academically gifted program out in Pender County. And he, we, we developed this four day program uh, to look at an archeological site. And this is the one, the first one we chose. And so they came down after some intro uh, about archeology span and all, they came down one day and spent, spent uh, the low tide investigating this site. Okay, next. And it, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was, at first they were trying to stay clean, but that, that wasn't possible. And then they were getting carried away and putting their hand, dirty handprints on the, the one uh, student that was trying to really stay clean. But we took a lot of measurements on the different features. Okay, next. Next, next. Okay, and there's different things that you can figure out. And one of the things we, like I said, we looked at the engine, we saw that it had been salvaged, it was cut off. Um, we learned, learned, later learned it was probably during World War II when the scrap drives, people were coming in. It was a paddle wheel steamer, got the measurements 138 feet long. Okay, next. They did recover some artifacts. Uh, next, next. Julianne? Okay. Yep. Uh, we went down to our laboratory down at Fort Fisher, looked at some artifacts. They sort of gave us an idea of what, what was going on. Then we got into the to records, archival records, and um, Bill Reeves. If you don't, if you're not, if you're not familiar with uh, Wilmington area, Bill Reeves was a his local historian who got all the Star News 
editions, paper editions, when they were throwing them out after microfilming them. And he sat up late at night for years, clipping all the articles out and putting them in appropriate places. And at one point, it, they had all got, they were out in a shed and were getting, all these records were getting deteriorating. So we helped them. Uh, the deal was we'd help them move them to the safety of the library. And he knew that there was a file folder on steamboats in the Wilmington area. Okay, next. And we had sort of narrowed it down to several wrecks, but uh, they did. We did get into the file box at the very end, uh, and and got into these wrecks. One of which, next, you'll see, was the Welcome Aw. And it it both was operating in the area and in, in the right period. And the article, one article, says that it burned right right opposite, uh, right in the right location was kind of interesting that it was uh, some boys that were over messing around and right after that after people saw them rowing across the thing burned up may have been eighth graders probably from Henry County uh, 100 years before but it also linked not only that boat but also to a government boat that it was before it became the welcome off okay next and it turns out it was the USS Commodore Hull, which had a quite a history of, during the Civil War uh, service uh, in the Albemarle Sound. It fought against the CSS Albemarle, uh, which there at the taking of Plymouth. And um, so th that was great. But where did it come from? All right, next. Well, it turns out that it was a Spanish uh, or a Cuban vessel being built right at the beginning of the war in 1861. It was a ferry boat designed to, to serve between in the Havana Harbor. And it, it was built just in, completed in uh, October and it made its way down, started making its way down and ran into trouble off of uh, Cape Hatteras and was taken in had to, had to come in for repairs and was taken into Georgetown, South Carolina, where they confiscated it and uh, wanted to arrest the crew. Half of the crew were uh, New Yorkers and half were Cuban. They wanted to arrest the, the Yankees and, um, and seize the boat. But the Spanish council interceded and convinced them to let it go. But the exchange was that they were to um, they were to deliver letters, a whole bunch of letters over to uh, the to the to Europe, and most of them were just Spaniards that were living in in Charleston, in and around Charleston, that were very very nervous about what's going to happen. There was shortages of food supplies and all, but a couple of the letters were from the War Department, the Confederate War Department, asking for um, supplies, rifles, and all. But anyway, they got underway and then they uh, went, were intercepted again down in Port Royal outside of that where the Union had just taken, uh, taken uh, possession of that area and they wanted to buy it you know, and the captain wouldn't let them. And so uh, they, they sort of hung, they, it hung around for a while. It had to get coal and water. In the meantime, when some of the crewmen, Northern crewmen had heard about these letters and reported it and the union officers came on board and it, it was built in New York and it was coming down to Havana when this all happened. And, it, uh, and when the union found, went on board, they found a carpet bag that had letters in it and then they heard there were more. They actually cut the uh, cut the uh, captain's cabin open and found more letters. And uh, so they seized the boat and eventually turned it into the Commodore Hall. The Cuban owners didn't know anything about this, and this went to, to court. And it wasn't settled until the early 1880s. 
when the when it when the U.S. Supreme Court found in favor of the Cuban owners and awarded them one hundred and forty four thousand dollars, which was a lot of interest uh, for their trouble. But the but the end of it, the the great thing was that there's over eight hundred pages of about this boat and and these letters, and we got the uh, UNCW language department to interpret them. Okay, next. Uh, so it's a great, it's a sort of a, a Wilmington secret there. It did become uh, a, a pleasure boat uh, there after the, after the war and uh, had some interesting uh, uh, news articles about men getting in, liquored up and pulling guns and women fainting. Um, and then it eventually became a work vessel and, and then was pulled up over there and, and uh, was eventually abandoned and then burned. Okay, next. And so I hope uh, as, as things develop that there will be an over, overlook there just below the site. You can look out and see the wreckage I and mean, it would interpret it and the uh, Wilmington in the background. Okay, but in the meantime, I think when you get to, Julianne's going to send out a link to a great article that was written in the prologue that we did on it, on it, and uh, the UNCW our, um, alumni magazine talks about their part and the, a little bit about the gen, all the wrecks and the tributaries. So, for more reading, head that way. Okay. That's the Nuestra Senor de Regla. And of course, uh, North Carolina has quite a maritime heritage and pirates are a part of that because we know Blackbeard was here. And we also know it because there have been people digging holes for treasure all over the place for so many years. Next. And, um, <clears throat> It's interesting, though, there's very little was known, particularly when we started about Edward Black Teach, it's pronounced Teach, spelled probably T-H-A-C-H-E. And <clears throat> there was really, after the wreck, there began some pretty intensive work. And uh, so we know, we know the history because there was a rare photograph found of Blackbeard next a baby picture. There he is with his beard. So we knew knew this was we were on the right trail. But uh, anyway, they uh, his his parents uh, had moved from Bristol down to uh, Jamaica, and he was raised wealthy, uh, well-to-do son. It was in the Royal Navy, and then um, then at some point uh, it became disillusioned and uh, turned piracy. Okay, next. So the Queen Anne's Revenge was, before it was Queen Anne's Revenge, it was a Concord, thus the name La Concord, out of Nantes. And it was owned by one of the leading slave owners, richest men in, in probably in France, one of the richest. And his business was uh, slave trading. It had made three, three voyages. It, it was actually built as a French privateer during the Queen Anne's War, but uh, when, that, when that ended, it became a, a slaver. And next. And on this third voyage, left uh, and, and went down to Africa, picked up 516 enslaved Africans and headed over to Martinique to offload and pick up sugar to haul back to Europe. Next. And this was a pretty typical uh, voyage. I mean, this was the triangle trade. They, 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 the shipping was according to winds and currents. They would go down to Africa and head over <laughs> to Europe and then up and out. Next. So not only was the shipping going on, but of course with shipping uh, came, came piracy and that 
after the Queen Anne's Revoir, war ended, the, and there a lot of heavy use of fire privateers for the government, as as Sudai warships. These guys, once uh, once peace came, they weren't really willing to go back and become merchant sail, sailmen, uh, but preferred to uh, take advantage of the situation. There was very little presence of the English Navy at the point. So that period from 1713 to, for about a 10 year period, but particularly height, the height was in 1717, 1718, when this took place, November 17th, Blackbeard encountered La Concorde. He has two vessels, Steve Bonnet with him and another little uh, sloop and he traded, he, he he didn't kill anybody. He just uh, and allowed, actually allowed the Frenchmen to get most of the enslaved Africans to uh, to shore. But he did take about a, a 150 enslaved Africans with him, and he also conscripted 10 of the French uh, crew, the, the the ones that had skills like the surgeons, the the pilot, the uh, barrel maker and uh, gunsmith. And then there were a few, four other uh, uh, Frenchmen that, that went ahead on their own, so 14. And they headed out from there, and you can see from different news articles that they, they were attacking ships after, uh, uh, after they had Queen Anne's Revenge and Steve Bonnet's adventure. Uh, uh, revenge. I mean, uh, they they you see them going up the island chain next, and then that uh, that winter they uh, hold up in uh, in the Bay of Honduras, and then and uh, and really didn't much activity. And then you see them heading back up the coast. By that time, they had uh, taken. Uh, they had a couple other vessels. They had uh, David Harriet's Adventure. It was another sloop. And then as they went by Cuba, they picked up a fourth small sloop. So they had four in their, their fleet and they headed to Charleston eventually and they blockaded the, the port, didn't let anybody in and out. They actually uh, detained six or seven boats, took off some of the uh, prominent citizens to held as captive took took a bunch of money they they had a, about a quarter of a million dollars in in all of what they had taken from these ships and they held out for a chest of medicine they were probably really low on, on essential supplies for their ailments so they were eventually given that and they took off next and headed up just the coast, up the coast a ways to uh, Beaufort, where they were, where at least Steve Bonnet knew the area. They were going to come in and, um, and I guess rest. And uh, North Carolina was pretty, was pretty isolated place then, and there weren't, there wasn't any British uh, naval presence at the time, but. Uh, Blackbeard sent the three smaller sloops in, and then he, as he was coming in in the morning, he wrecked. He sent uh, uh, one of his main men in to get the adventurer to bring it out, and it was wrecked also. And the other two small sloops basically saved all the people and um, got some of the goods off. But the wreck itself was a loss, and uh, the adventurer also, which is still yet to be found was there. Okay, next. And then Blackbeard uh, was operating out of Ocracoke. He took that smallest sloop, the Cuban sloop, and, and renamed it Adventure and used it uh, to, to, to do some uh, attacking. And he was out pirating. He was, like I say, there in Bath, sort of around the, the government, allowed him to hang out. And uh, Steve Bonnet was also went out pirating in his vessel, and um, it was eventually captured. Steve Bonnet was captured and hung in September, and Blackbeard was later uh, cornered and killed 
in Ocracoke in, uh, in November. So that's the end of those pirates, but not the end of the ship. Okay, next. So this has been a vessel that we had we had sort of known about, uh, but it wasn't really part of the lore. The fact that Queen Anne's Revenge, the wreck was there, wasn't in the record books really. It wasn't a big secret, but he, there was treasure everywhere in North Carolina, but the, the actual real evidence uh, of, of Blackbeard wasn't on the radar. But in uh, 1996, a, a group that was searching for one of the Spanish treasure wrecks also realized that they might find Queen Anne's Revenge and was actively seeking that. And that was an easier one because there was a lot of cannons on Queen Anne's Revenge and they were using a magnetometer to, to find the, uh, to, to detect anomalies that, uh, that they could investigate. Okay. It's a, it's a nice place to work. I've lived in, you know, all, all my career was mostly in muddy rivers and creeks. And uh, this is just about a mile off of Fort Macon outside the inlet. And they, uh, wasn't a lot to see, but there was enough. It was a pile of a, about uh, 50, 50 feet by 25 feet. Next, only 25 feet deep. So we could, it was a great place to work. Early on, we got our geological, uh, our colleagues in geology, marine geology, to do all kinds of surveys to figure out why it was there, why hadn't it been studied. It, could it been, does it fit the records of the Queen Anne's Revenge and how much was left and that kind of thing. Next. And by the end, this was discovered in 96, by the end, within a 15 years, the technology, this is multi-beam sonar that is just unbelievable. Uh, and, and you can see, I guess the major thing we picked up with this is that the site was was exposed. They started dredging the channel. You can see just above the QAR site. That was always wagged back and forth, but in the early 20th century, they, they fixed it and they kept dredging it deeper and deeper. And you can see they put the sand out. You see the sort of a weird formation out off the, the, the yellow is all a sand disposal. So all the sand was being taken sort of off the site, not, not directly, but it wouldn't, couldn't replenish it. So that's why it became exposed. And not only that, but it is in a threatened position because every one of these storms that comes by just does a little bit of more churning and mixing things up. Next. So we did a exploration dives. We started in 96 and we had a whole a crew of, uh, of the people that discovered it in, in uh, University of Wilmington and also East Carolina. And we basically just did testing. You can see the different trenches just to try to get a feeling for how extensive it was. Of course, we were trying to identify the site, make sure it was Queen Anne's Revenge. And, uh, so after a few years, we were certain uh, that it's what it, what it was and that it was in threatened condition and we needed to proceed with excavations. The big key of it, part of it was getting a conservation lab to take care of all the remains. And that was uh, set up up at East Carolina in, in cooperation partnership with them in the state. Next. So if so underwater excavations are similar to land archaeology, but as you can imagine, a little bit different. We use these vacuum cleaner, um, these, these dredges that suck up the sand. When it gets when we get down to artifacts, we tag them and map them. And uh, but in because we could just just like a, a, on land, the sifters you use for the dirt catch things you might miss. We have these what are really gold sluices that you run the water through down these 
ripples and slews and then through a screen. So really everything is captured and uh, recorded, picked up, small artifacts are picked up and taken and then kept wet and taken up to the lab for processing, okay? And so far in the, the, uh, the 10 um, years since, since we started, it, it, uh, we've recovered 60% of the site. Started from off the stern, which was the, or off the offshore end, because that was, because everything was being pushed. So that was a good, we knew we were getting everything if we started there. That was the stern of the vessel. And you can see, the cannons and anchors and all the little stuff that we've taken up. 40% is still most mostly out there that it still needs to come up at some point. Okay, next. And it's a, it's a treasure trove of artifacts, as you can see, stuff that, I mean, it's been beaten up, stuff that obviously maybe wasn't important uh, or they couldn't take with them too heavy, but Next, let's see what it is. So the first thing in trying to figure out what it, what it was was whether it fit the profile of La Concorde. And one of the things was that the, the vessel was very well armed. It had started with 28 as a slaver. It was still armed because of pirates, but not as many. And then when Blackbeard took it over, he he not only got the 28 back up, but probably had a lot of uh, uh, another 12 uh, rail guns and smaller guns to supposedly had 40 cannon on board. Next. And boy, when you brought up a cannon, the, the whole world knew about it. It was wonderful. Even, even the first one, these are the first two we brought up. And it was kind of a hairy operation, a uh, rough day. This is the Dan Moore from Cape Fear Community College. Um, but, and we were so happy to get it up. But uh, e even the, the, the 13th and 14th, uh, it would get attention. So we usually, through the years, would bring a cannon up every year, sort of as promotion and excitement. Next. And this was a great time to get it out to the public too. I think people, the pirate ship and, and cannon, pirate cannons, they're thinking they're all clean and a skeleton is hanging on to them. Well, they're, they're really a rusty, crusty stuff hanging on them, stinking, popping because of all the critters, the, the barnacles and all they're protesting. And so it was a great time to have it uh, wherever we had it at, at Fort Macon or or at the aquarium up in Pine Knoll Shores. It was a great time to let people to see what it looked like before uh, and all this work had to do, be done to it to stabilize it. Next. And that was a big issue uh, was leaking tanks. They're very heavy. And when you get them to try to work on them, they punch holes in it. And finally, uh, Parker boats fiberglass, about 20 of these tanks and uh, and we we've, we've been not had any leaks since then that was a big huge thing community was always involvement has been so good next and a cannon uh, as i said is a lot of work it takes about 5 years to the cleaning is not that long but it takes a while to clean it and get it uh, but the to get all the salts out of the metals electrolysis goes on and on, takes takes a lot of time. So these are, uh, and they're, they're big museum pieces, but they take a while to get, to get ready. Next. And the funny thing is uh, most of these were loaded and that was the hard part. You can see these uh, people struggling. They're not struggling to push the, push the pipe in to clean it out, but to try to get it loose so they could push it back in. So quite a struggle. But you can see that there were cannonballs and the wadding and the evidence of the outer. The one on the bottom there has a little wooden tompion, a little wooden plug 
that uh, that still survived because it was down in the mud and, and didn't get eaten up by the, the worms. So uh, that's a that's an indication it was a pirate ship. Everything was loaded. Next. And uh, so we have, uh, I think it's over 30 now uh, cannons. So that there's no other vessel that sank in that area that's even, even close to that. So that was a good indicator. One of the loads was these spikes, this what we call Langrage, uh, sort of make, make up the kind of things that the fire, pirate would want to fire at you. They don't want to kill you. They don't want to sink the boat. They just want to scare you. And uh, uh, so that would be a heck of a load to see come whizzing by you, these nine inch spikes. Next. We did have a portion of the wreck, you got to realize there's very little of the actual wooden vessel left, but uh, we did get the, the stern post, which the rudder hang, hung on to, and there were some draft marks, and this is a, wasn't 12 inch foot, 12 inches between the marks, but 12.75, which is a French foot. So another indication, it's Le Concorde. Next. And this uh, blown glass, that was in the that was in the cabin, the, the officer's cabin, is definitely French. Next, and as I said, some of the things are recognizable: a glass bottle, some pewter plates, just needed a little cleaning. But most of it was concretion, what we call concretion, and it's a mixture of sand and calcium, and it forms around iron iron objects mostly, but it sucks everything around it sort of sucks into it next and it and there there are a lot of work it's almost like a little archaeological excavation in the lab as you can see all these artifacts in there and they have to be taken down with an air scribe like like a, a dentist would use on your teeth to slowly extract it some of the some of the iron is gone and needs to be put epoxy, epoxy in it to cast it and get an exact replica Next, but there was hundreds and hundreds of these artifacts. They could x-ray them and sometimes see things uh, that they wanted to, to help them excavate it. And these were beads, glass beads that had lead, leaded glass beads and lead shot. Next. And as, in all that needs to be analyzed, and uh, I'm the archaeology guy, I can analyze some of it, but Linda Carnes McNaughton, who is the co-author with, with our, on our book, that's her, she's extraordinary. Her, her knowledge of all things uh, and who, who made them, why they made them, where they made them is just unbelievable. And so she was indispensable in looking at all these artifacts, which we'll do right now. Next. So it was a, a really global collection of artifacts because that's, it was just, that's when it was uh, global trans uh, ex exploration and transporting, uh, uh, I mean, trading artifacts and all of these different countries were known, known about, uh, known for their different objects, but, but the artifacts were principally tied to the French, large collection of French and English, which is what you would expect from this ship, which was a French vessel slaver, then turned pirate. The vessel, um, maybe I didn't say it, but the vessel uh, was run aground when Blackbeard came in. So it was just a derelict that ran on the shoals and couldn't be gotten off or wasn't, they didn't want to get it off. And it just sort of deteriorated as it sank, and these artifacts kind of just fell that fell down. The sails washed off. Eventually, the worms got in the wood, and so it's just a, a really like like today. If your house burned down, what would be left in the rubble? That's kind of what we're dealing with. But you see, there's a lot left in the rubble. Okay, next. A lot of ceramics, and that that's was uh, very their characteristic of different places, uh, French and German. Uh, and that's that's 
they and they survive through time. So that's good. Next. These are kind of like the cardboard boxes of the or the days, these large uh, amphoras large, and we didn't have a whole one. Well, we have a lot of pieces. We might be able to at least get one together, but uh, it would have looked like that. And this is a French off a French vessel, similar. Next. This shows the extent of trade. This is a little Chinese teapot that was on board. Next. So this is an artifact that, that artifacts are difficult, especially iron artifacts, but particularly when you have other materials, which this is hemp. This is a, what we thought was a hook wrapped with a rope, a hemp that maybe to protect whatever it was hooking, uh, we didn't know, but we thought it was a, well, it wasn't too interesting. And so it sat in the, it sat in the lab for a long time. And then finally, uh, somebody saw a National Geographic article next and realized what it was. It was a leg iron for, uh, for the slave trade and the, the rope would have been put around it to decrease the size so it would fit better depending on who it was. So there, now we have a, a not, now, now it's not only a pirate ship, but now we see that it's tied to slavery in the slave business. Next. And there were a few other things. These were little pieces of jewelry, Akon jewelry, which were uh, prized in, in, uh, in Africa. It's very extensive, beautiful, beautiful work. Um, but here, the, the jewelry has been clipped up into basically to make it gold dust. The pirates didn't care so much about the value, the artistic value, but just the monetary value. So we have pieces and we had uh, not a total an ounce or so of gold, but it, uh, lots and lots of different uh, little pieces, thousands and thousands of flakes because we were recovering everything. So it was great. Okay, next. And some trade beads, as I, you saw in the x-ray, there were a lot of beads, which would have been used similar to the, that was used in the Americas to um, trade and to placate the uh, <clears throat> fidgety enslaved Africans. Tobacco was also given to, um, as incentive rewards on board. Next. But, uh, you know, there's reports of Blackbeard having Blacks. Uh, he had, when he was accosted at Ocracoke and killed, there were five uh, Africans that were with him. And, but we don't know what status they had. Uh, we assume that, uh, we do know that some of them, the ones that he took off of La Concorde were sold. And then uh, some were, did menial chores and, and some may have, been elevated above that. Next, <clears throat> because they were loyal and good fighters. But there's one artifact, these uh, lead, when it comes up, these lead uh, weights for a uh, net weights. And these are uh, probably African and, and very well may have uh, either come with the, the enslaved Africans or been uh, used because the English were deep sea fishermen and not really uh, used to this maritime, shall, uh, like North Carolina, shallow coasts. Um, but the Africans, many of them came from a maritime culture. A lot of them were brought because of their uh, knowledge of rice plantation, rice in, uh, cultivation and came over here. Next, and this was in the captain's cabin, maybe was uh, kept there, and then when they got close to shore, the Af some of the Africans were allowed to go uh, get water, get wood, and get fish. Next, we have had a uh, in the book uh, several paintings by Jenny Wright Frierson, who did a great job to illustrate all the artifacts we're finding in um, in their in how they would have been used. This is. Blackbeard, and you see Steve Bonnet in the back. Next. 
and we have one pair of shoe buckles that has SB and very well may, may be speed bonnets. Next, so we can, uh, we employed a lot of uh, specialists. One is a, a, my a colleague, David Clark, who was, specializes in faunal analysis. And he took the bones and realized that they were not only bad salt, salt beefed, barrels of salt beef they had on board, but they had pigs running on board too, and lots of uh, wine and liquor. Next. So I just show this because there are a lot of cannons on board, but all the small arms are missing and they were taken off. So it does show that it was an abandonment. This is a little signal gun that was left on board, uh, probably not a weapon. Next. There is some markings, these apotropaic uh, markings or, or little superstitious markings that are found in English doorways uh, that, that it's may, that the gunners may have uh, been afraid or, or wishing luck. These are lead apron, uh, cannon aprons that would have been put over the touch hole or each cannon to keep the salt water out. And it was pliable so they could uh, do their doodles while they were just hanging out. And, uh, so that's really neat. Okay, next. And lots of small stuff, grenades and small artifacts. Uh, again, pirates were trying to uh, just scatter shot and, and get you get the opposing crews, the ships they're taking to uh, give up and not sink the ship necessarily. Next. Just a few pieces and parts and, and reworked artifact uh, uh, guns that were left behind, but they're they're nice, a nice serpentine side plate, all dating to the right period. Next. Sur the French surgeons, there's evidence of them, another Jenny Wright Frierson painting. Next. A little cockerel from this lamp that's a French origin. Next, urethral syringe for naughty pirates, administer mercury for syphilis. Next, and uh, there were a number of weighing cup sets, some of them maybe the surgeons, but some were probably taken from other ships to weigh out not only medicines, but weigh out the gold dust to do, divide it up. Next. This is not a coin, it's a coin weight to authenticate, a brass weight to authenticate the gold guinea, but it has Queen Anne on it. So here's the, here's the namesake of the ship tied to it. And the pirates Light Queen Anne, she had been, uh, she, when she died, that was the pirate privateering period. They didn't like King George who took over. And so uh, it was Queen Anne's revenge. Next. And this is a, actually a coronation glass for uh, George I and um, was on board. Another, again, this really pin pointing the period of this vessel and when it sank. Next. And here's another, just one part of the, and this may have been a uh, French surgeon's uh, sword, but it has uh, Louis the 15th, which is, um, the, had just come into power in uh, 1715. Cool stuff. Next. And this is a, uh, was a question mark. I didn't know what it was. We thought it was a piece of leather with these lead rivets in it. But, uh, and I don't know if anybody can guess, but you're good if you can. Next. It's a, it's a lantern, a thin, thin uh, horn that was used to, um, as lantern panes, not leather. Next. And here's another mystery. It's a tube. We didn't know what it was. It was found in the very stern and uh, thought it was some kind of vent or something, but it 
turns out to be a very special thing. Next, it's Blackbeard's head. It's the toilet in the officer's quarter. So we found his head. His head had been cut off at Ocracoke in the, in the battle when he was killed. They took the head back to Williamsburg. This is our head. Okay, next. And I'm gonna finish up with a, a quick reading on the bell. And the bell is, a, when you find a ship's bell, it's, it's a shipwreck, on a shipwreck, it's, it's amazing. And this was found the first day, uh, next. And it was cleaned up. We were hoping it would say Le Concorde. It just had a religious inscription on it. Uh, the date we thought was 1709, but it, it was actually a, a five. A, a, that's the way the fives looked back in the early 1700s. Uh, it was announced, uh, this, this was used to announce the wreck of six months after it had been discovered. And I, I love that picture. That's Linda looking like they've seen the ghost of uh, Blackbeard in the inside. Next. And so we had it analyzed. And uh, I just read real quick uh, about bells. When the bell was rung, uh, he noted, so we did a, we got a recorded it for them because they really wanted to hear it, not only see it. These five notes produced a remarkable musical effect, giving the sensation of harmony. As time passed, this sound became associated with important ritual acts, both festive as well as sorrowful. And the human area here became accustomed to it, recognized the sound as its own, and took the sound as a key reference point for daily life. This was true whether the ears belonged to townspeople, churchgoers, or shipmates aboard a pirate ship. Dr. Bio gave the sound even higher meaning. Bells represent the living music of the past because they are the only instruments that can retain their original sound throughout the centuries. The restoration of this bill, bell is magnificent, and I suppose that you can still hear its beautiful music. This cultural aspect is of utmost importance because it is the only sound of Blackbeard's ship that we can experience in its original totality. And so to end, I wanted to ring that bell. You can listen for Blackbeard. Is it, am I gonna, or can you do that? Sure. Click, click, click on the little icon. I hear it. Did you do it? Click on the icon again, Julian. Are you not hearing it? Are you not hearing not. it? Okay. No. All right. I'm I'm playing it, but let's see. Well, it doesn't sound like anybody's hearing it. Um. Can I, well, maybe I'll, include, I can, I'll include uh, that in the here. email too. Can I can I reduce the size of my thing and get get it? Let's see. All right. Well, sorry to everybody. I'll I'll include that in the follow up email as well. A link to that. I don't know why you can't hear it. Okay. Well, sorry about the technical difficulties. It's all my fault. So the, the toilet, so that, can you go back to the toilet, the, the Blackbeard's head? Sorry to spin over that, but if you're not a nautical person, in a ship, the ship's head is the toilet. And so we, we were trying to figure out exactly what this was. And then it, it, we just had a big chuckle when somebody said, well, it's the, it's the officer's head it's a liner this is the liner for the toilet which would have been a little little uh, structure on the hanging off the stern and then the waste would have gone out into the water okay let's finish up it's fine you want to go into uh q a right now mark or do you want to um sure keep going through the slides just okay. go a little bit further finish okay. the slideshow there's a couple more slides I wanted to I wanted to tell you that uh, so you can see these artifacts <clears throat> if and uh, there there is a 
the, the largest collection in the repository for these most artifacts are at North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort. I highly recommend you go down there. They have just opened the Legend of Blackbeard. It's an expanded exhibit at the North Carolina Museum of History. Um, and then there's also like Steve Bonnet's Buckle is at Southport. So you, if you're in, in the Wilmington area, and uh, if you're up in Washington, D.C., they have a, uh, a great exhibit, The Pirates in the Atlantic World and their artifacts and explanation from Queen Anne's Revenge. Now, the, <clears throat> the only issue is that um, with COVID, you may be asked to wear an eye patch uh, to get in and, uh, or maybe have a parrot on your shoulder to verify that uh, you're, you're not infectious. But if not, uh, next you can, if you want to stay at home and and uh, and get down in the bilges and read a good book. This is our book, and it it's, uh, explains everything in great detail and in in a good way that you can understand it. Uh, so that's I encourage you to 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 do your homework and explore, and I'll be glad to ask answer a few questions. Well, thank you so much. I apologize to everybody for the technical difficulties. I think uh, I think the ghost of um, Blackbeard knew that you were gonna show one of his baby pictures and <laughs> interfered. There you go. Um, yeah. well, we, we have one um, one question first from Melissa Meisman, who asked, with all this history found, did anyone from Hollywood ever reach out for research or use of items for any movies? There have been documentaries. Uh, Discovery Channel did one, and, um, and the... Uh, um, the public radio, the public television did one early on. There's been a different, some different ones, but to my knowledge, there's not been any um, anything that's um, um, Hollywood-like. I think that was the hope, actually, the people that discovered it had kept the media rights to it with the hope that Hollywood would swoop in and uh, it just didn't happen, so. Let me see. Here's the. Can I see if I can ring this bell? Yeah. I can hear that. Okay. There you go. I heard it. So hopefully everyone else did too. Um, another question um, is. Uh, what what condition is uh, the site currently in, and um, like what is what's the condition of the things that are still there, and what do you hope to see happen? The as I said, that uh, about sixty percent of the site has been brought up. We're hoping to um, eventually get it all up. We think it would it would be unprecedented to see that. It's uh, expensive and it. Uh, takes time and energy to do that. I guess one of the, the last expedition was 2015. So the last five, six years have really allowed us to catch up in the lab and that's a good thing. Uh, but uh, but the, one of the problems is that what's left out there is still getting stirred around in the storms. It is also the the forward section of the vessel where the enslaved Africans and crew would have been. And so it's really, you only have half the story. And so we're hoping that, uh, like I said, with the, with the name or with the black beard and all that we could uh, see it finalized. And um, it would be a great, a, a great source for archeology, underwater archeology, archeologists, because there's never been a, a wreck a scattered wreck like this, a shipwreck that's been fully excavated to understand exactly how things deteriorate through time. I mean, that's what we're trying to do as detectives in time is figure out what, um, uh, how, how we can interpret what happened from what, the little bit that we have. 
Another question from Robin Jones. She wants to know what was the headliner made of? Lead. Okay. Um, another question is from Judy Pierce. Where is the bell now? The bell is in Beaufort, North Carolina on display. Okay. And it, and you, that it, that they don't have it set up the ring. So you were really one of the few people to A hear the ting show. ting, <laughs> the clunk clunk. <laughs> A question from Thomas Massey. Um, how do we know that a second ship was sent to assist and foundered? It's in the records. They, the, uh, the, the, the best source for description of the, of the event was when Steve Bonnet's men were captured. And Steve Bonnet and his men were captured down. They were actually captured right down here in, near Southport, but they were taken down to, um, uh, Charleston and, and, uh, and uh, put on trial and hung. But in that, in that testimony, they talked about Blackbeard uh, and they felt like it was run aground on, on purpose because, and also ran aground the other vessel on purpose. They, and then when they got ashore in the, uh, they, uh, Blackbeard sent Steve Bonnet up to Bath to get the pardon and sent him away. And then uh, Blackbeard ransacked the Revenge, the, the third vessel, the, the two one of the two vessels that survived and took the, the last vessel with him and didn't share any of the, the loot. And like I said, they had uh, several hundred thousand dollars worth of gold and silver on board and he took it all. So they were pretty disgruntled about it and uh, just described that and that vessel's not been found. It's probably under the under the the sands or it's got to be under the sand somewhere, but that's maybe for another day we'd like to finish what we started on Queen Anne's Revenge. I'll ask one more question. Um, I know we've gone a little bit over five, but um did you, a question from Robin Jones, did you say you use LIDAR to look under the water's surface and um, how deep could you see? We were using, uh, it was found with a magnetometer which measures distortions in the earth's magnetic field, sort of like a metal detector, but, uh, and so that just gives you a, a big reading. Wow, there's something here and you can see that it's big. And that's what happened with these anchors and cannon. And then uh, we were just diving at that point and, uh, and then video and, and underwater photography came in once. The first times we dove on it, you couldn't see a thing. We just felt it. Uh, but then when we started diving in the next year in October, it was 25 feet of visibility. And so that's the way we, did that the sonar was used sort of on a broader broader scope to um, see how it set in the see how it um, what was exposed and they it, it first it's just a, a single beam and you can kind of see something or a side scan you can kind of see something but it by this multi beam at the end was able to detect all the, the elevations within a few centimeters. So you could see where the depressions were and where the sand was. And then they would come in and take multiple surveys from different years and they could, could tell you, well, look, here's, here's where you're losing the sand or, or take it after a storm and see. So that's, that's the technology we're using um, to, to see. Uh, and and the, I will say also that positioning in the beginning uh, was ter was terrible and we were using and, and it was being scrambled by uh, the military because they didn't want you to they, they they didn't want people to know where our military uh, weapons were so so uh, the, the anyway the, the science and the technology has come a long way in the 20 years since it was discovered. 
Oh, well, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, this is this has been great, and uh, a lot of people have already put in the chat that this is a great presentation. So again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, I, I think there was something spooky going on, um, but really, thank thank you so much, and um, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, if you enjoyed this presentation, we do have another uh, shelter series at the end of the month on another pirate. Um, so you can uh, sign up and register for that. And we hope to see you for another shelter series. Thank you again, Mark. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.